actually, uh, I came to Singapore from India when I was seven years old. I landed at Tanjungpara Harbour in 1952 mm -hmm. off a boat called the Virjula. Now, this name is very famous for all Indians who have ever come to Singapore. Whenever you came to Singapore by boat, this was the boat that you came on. And uh, <coughs> when we arrived, we were met by my father who had already come here. He came over in 1947. And the reason why he left Kerala, where we come from, was because he was considered to be from a caste that was superior and the few people who took over after independence felt that these people who were superior shouldn't get anything in jobs or in education. So the Nayas to which we belong were cut to 1% in education and 1% in jobs. Which meant that my father who was a teacher suddenly found himself without a job and without prospects. So he, I, I had a, a grand uncle who had been doing a, business in Malaya and Singapore since the 1930s. And he wrote, my father wrote to him and he said, come over, I'll send a ticket for you to come on the Regula. So he came over on the Regula in 1947. But it wasn't until 1952 that he had a stable job and was able to bring my mother and me over. <clears throat> so the beginning is that. And, uh, I'm going to talk about Singapore then and now. And so for me, the beginning is 1952. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened before that is hearsay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have read it. I, I probably know it quite well. But it doesn't uh, sort of impinge in the way that... Uh, now, fast forwarding through all that, I went to Ara. I grew up in Havelock Road. That, I think, is a very important uh, aspect of... What yeah, what I am. Second floor, second floor. Uh, anyone of second you level. who knows Havelock Road in the 50s, mid 50s, would know that that was the biggest fancy area in Singapore. So I grew up a Chinese something. <laughs> With a nickname. <laughs> I was charming. <laughs> and even today, I sometimes bum into my old schoolmates. I, it just happened in the 1980s, mid-1980s. And I was rushing my father to 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 hospital because of when he had his first heart attack. And in the lift, I bumped into a huge guy with three stripes on his uh, arm pad. And the guy looked at me, and then he said, Chow what are you doing here? <laughs> and then I looked at him and he said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm taking my father. He said, OK. He had a corporal with him. Corporal? Do whatever is necessary. But I mean, it, there, there are many such stories, you know, which in the old days, I don't know whether these stories will continue today. And this is part of the music which I've been doing about Singapore then and now. The Singapore that I knew <coughs> was a society that I find very difficult to to understand today that that Singapore doesn't exist. It was a Singapore which was a which was a colony to start with. When we first went to school, we sang God Save the King. And then it became God Save the Queen. And then it became nothing else. And then it became the Malaysian national anthem. And finally it became Majila Singapore. But, <clears throat> but I mean, you know, these were progressions, which also meant that I was growing up and that I was becoming part of the environment, part of the uh, framework of something. And that something was Singapore. So I'm a very committed Singaporean, and I've always been committed enough in the 60s to stand up and heckle Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Committed enough to edit the Singapore Underground. Committed enough to write. Committed enough to go on television and speak. And in uh, 1980, 
on the National Day Forum with uh, two ministers and journalists and so on. I was asked to lead off on the question of do we have a national identity? And this was when the Mandarin campaign was being moved. And I, I spent 10 minutes <coughs> saying why I thought that that was going to have <coughs> a shattering impact on Singapore as we knew it. I said if 80% of the population speak one language, the remaining 20% are going to become the class citizens, whether you want to. Because they won't have a common language with which to communicate to the 80%. Because the 80% 80, the 80 of them uh, are going to be able to communicate in the same language. Why would they want to communicate in any other language? English should be the language for work and Mandarin will become the language for personal communication. I don't know whether this has happened, but I do get the feeling that the Chinese are in one box, the Malays are in another box, the Indians are in one box, and that there is a certain amount of interaction, of course there has to be, but I don't think there is an integration into an identity that we can call Singapore. And this is something that I felt then, and I still do. <coughs> now, <coughs> that brings me to actually what I wrote, because this was in the way of preamble. I started off by saying that Singapore is a multicultural society in the way that China, Japan, and Korea are not. They are monolingual societies, monocultural societies. They are societies that have foreigners who may be living there, that people may use English in business and international communication, but culturally, they are monoblock. They have one culture, and that's it. Singapore is not. I mean, our history of being all immigrants says that we do not have a single culture. We are a uh, <coughs> mixture of cultures. And and uh, I, you know, in colonial times, segregation along ethnic lines was facilitated because it kept people in boxes that the British wanted them to be. So they could favor one if they wanted and pull back privileges from another whenever it was deemed necessary for, for their purposes. And uh, <clears throat> I start, while I was thinking about this, I started writing a simple poem. It, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not one of my usual poems. I'm one of those who don't like writing on public themes. I don't like writing on the Malay. <laughs> it's never been my sort of thing. <laughs> with uh, apologies to everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all recorded. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 when I started thinking about this, I started jotting down a few lines, and the lines got longer and longer, and uh, so I ended up with this. The very air was different then. Long Kang smells coalesced with that of old men in a silent valley pulling oval containers from holes in backyard walls. Empty spool from honey wagons, full slotted in. Empties into toilet wheels <coughs> and someone's mother's anatomy fluently described down the whole road. Then skeletons in shorts and torn singlets breathing in underdevelopment, clinging to the rear of honey trucks, avoiding bejaks, with women also clinging onto children, vegetables, and meat, from filthy market stalls, where live chickens meet quick slashes to the throat with rolling eyes, and bleed into tin pails before being, before being bathed in boiling water and undressed. Now that's a picture of Singapore in the 1950s, where you had uh, toilets 
you have nine saw carriers, and you have these trucks which could hold 32 containers. And, and uh, there was a uh, treatment facility where Boogie's uh, station now stands. And when I say the air was different then, I really mean it. <laughs> but you had to live then to, to be really be appreciated. I mean, descriptions are not going to give you the, 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 the reality of what it was. But that was a reality that we lived in. <coughs> well, the growth in English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil education for locals after the Second World War made for a society in Singapore in the 1950s that was bi or trilingual, even a proficiency in the second or third language was at substandard or bizarre levels. Racism was open and rampant, but tolerance and goodwill helped to dampen this and make daily communication and interaction between different races more or less amicable. I mean, growing up as a boy in those days, we were in and out of each other's houses, whether you're a Malay, you're a Chinese, or you're Indian. And, and we participated in all the festivals. We participated in the daily life of other families. As children, there were no barriers. We grew up together, we learned about each other, and we, we sort of got along together. There were no boxes as such. The rise of English, Chinese educated middle classes, the English and Chinese educated middle classes pushed nationalism <coughs> towards independence. That was where the, the first stirrings for uh, independence came from. From the fact of the English educated, from the fact of the Chinese educated. Don't forget that in those days, 50% of educated people went to Chinese schools. Full Mandarin schools, medium mm -hmm. schools. The other 50 went to uh, English language schools. And some went to Malay schools, a very tiny minority went to Tamil schools. The, the, uh, <coughs> okay, now reflect. Leaving this aside, superimpose these images onto trolley buses, curving from Silidi into Bras Basa, where voluble mama sell textbooks, old and new to scrub schoolboys, and further down past Joseph herding boy and girl, Peter Chong catered to the final taste in books old and new. Across, across North Bridge Road, giggling convent girls, once eyed the rigorously imprisoned lads where the institution stood. Proud of tradition, but groaning with rotting wood and changing mores. The fact that was that most Chinese Singaporeans in the 1950s and 60s spoke their own dialect of origin, but preferred that their children be educated in either English or Mandarin. And this led to an English educated, Chinese educated cleavage <coughs> and post independence struggles based on this divide. Younger Chinese Singaporeans have been brought up with the Mandarin for ethnic Chinese policy of the 1980s and no longer remember a time when dialects were spoken or how society was organized and functional. So when they read a poem like Li Su Peng's, My Country and My People, they find it hard to understand why she bothers so much about her gentle brown skinned neighbors. <coughs> but those of my and earlier generations understand only too well. Continuing the thought, don't forget these are musings. I mean, you know, they, 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 they sort of jump a little from image to image. So the continuity of the poem, I'm breaking it with a little bit of commentary. <coughs> so, <coughs> and further on, hardy Eurasians made the end of the Orang Pute Gulf, a width greater than the Padang from the then rulers of the world. While Babas, <coughs> while Babas convoked eccentricities into a culture already unsure whether to claim as kin 
the villages of Semban, Chongpang, Angmukyo, or Tanjungru, Yunus, Sikla, Changi, or even God forbid, Violin, Ho Sui, Potong Pase. Unsure before becoming white collar clerks, <coughs> very civil servants of the crown. <coughs> now, I, I've already uh, said I came to Singapore in seven and so forth, so I won't repeat that. But <coughs> after our arrival, for the next few years, we moved from one small room to another all over the island. So I attended in sequence the Kansas School in Sophia Road in 1952, where I learned my ABCs. I'm bad, huh? I'm bad. <laughs> the ABCs had something to do with it as well. I know. <laughs> 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 Wampo English School of Towner Road, which doesn't exist anymore, 1953-54. Bukit Panjang Primary School of Ten Mile Bukitima Road, 1954-55 which Edwin Kambu had attended before, which I didn't know. So, I don't think it was that <laughs> And finally, from 1955 to 58, Havelock Road School, from which, after the PSLA, I was admitted to ARA. Now, that was the sort of high point of my life. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because Havelock Road School was not considered academically anywhere on the table. But that year, three of us made it to RI. And in those days, admission into RI was by, uh, by merit. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> you have to be in the PSLE tables to be admitted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but then after that the PP came in and they had a policy where they said proximity rather than policies change, people change. So 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 there I was moving from uh, room to room because my father was working in two jobs to try to make ends meet and uh, and you know, we actually, I actually uh, know what it means to be poor. Gently poor. So, so because of this odyssey, I came very early into contact with many different parts of Singapore. And this accelerated my integration into society as I was forced to remake friends and adjust to new teachers and new circumstances. Especially in Hamburg. It was a time when you didn't go out, when you didn't stare at anybody because you could be stabbed immediately. When if you were asked uh, what number you played, you looked down on the ground and said, no, 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 because uh, it, was, it was that kind of era. And, uh, and uh, by the age of 12, I had been in the aftermath of the territory of two gang fights. So, and uh, the uh, Delta Circus incident in 1955 took place 300 meters uh, yards away from my uh, my father's SIT flat in Delta Circus. You know, hockey bus riots and all that. So, so it was a time that uh, was very exciting. And when you are about uh, 10, 11 years old, it's very exciting that all these things are going on. You don't think about the uh, the other implications of what is happening. And uh, <coughs> I don't know whether it was this that made me start writing at nine years old. Uh, I think it was my headmaster, Mr. Boonet. He was a very strict headmaster. And one day there were all these hurdles sitting in front, you know. The, the Havelock Road School became the Boys' Brigade Headquarters, and now it's the Girls' Brigade Headquarters or something. The school is still there. It is one of the few single-story uh, school buildings left in Singapore. And next to it, they built this two-story uh, Delta School. But, I mean, the Havelock Road School was like something. It was a small school, but not very large. So we actually sort of knew everybody. 
for example, John Lee Singh was <coughs> his sister was my classmate, and he was one year ahead of me. <coughs> and and uh, one of the things that I still remember from that period, Epitaph Hokkien, which uh, I used to speak, but I don't anymore because when you've been away uh, for as long as I have, anyway, nobody speaks Hokkien in Singapore. Anymore. But one of the things that I still remember, which uh, sort of, this is where the, the interaction of cultures comes in. I mean, we used to have this old man who used to sit on the five foot way with a little string instrument and and declaim the stories from Motomaji in in, in, in Hokkien. And it was very sort of, you know, and so you get all these guys in short pants, you know, sitting squatting on the five foot way or sitting on the five foot way, listening rapidly to all these adventures. And then we go off and reenact them. And run around, you know, making uh, noise all over the place. <laughs> <laughs>